Welcome from Loyola University Chicago Libraries. And thank you for joining us today. We will get started shortly. Hello, so before we get started, we have a few reminders to help you with the webinar experience. So in this webinar format, we have turned off the cameras, microphones and chat functions for the participants. You will have an opportunity to ask questions toward the end of the program though. So please use the Q&A button on your screen and enter your questions or comments. And then finally, we will be recording today's presentation with the speakers view only, and we will share the video with you after the event. So it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our Associate Dean of Libraries, Emma Heat. Emma? Thank you, Jocelyn. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program hosted by Loyola University Chicago Libraries. In partnership with alumni relations, we are called Dialogues. I am Emma Heat, Associate Dean of the Libraries. Thank you for joining us for this presentation of Loyola at 150, Student Life Timeline Project. I'm delighted that three of our sesquicentennial scholars and now Loyola alumni are here to present this project that was created to commemorate the 150th anniversary of Loyola's founding. This digital project explores Loyola's history and the connections between the Loyola student body and the world while highlighting student life at Loyola and Mundelein College. This tremendous project could only be accomplished through the dedication and support of many individuals and campus partners. In 2018, the Center for Textual Studies and Digital Humanities, the Public History Program, and the university libraries collaborated on a proposal to commemorate Loyola's 150th anniversary. We received funding from the president's office to hire graduate students in digital humanities and public history to design, create, and implement projects for the anniversary celebration. The students known to us as the sesquicentennial scholars researched Loyola's history tested and selected software platforms and created digital projects using archival materials to demonstrate Loyola's evolution from 1870 to 2020. A special thanks goes to our archivists from the Loyola Archives and Special Collections and the Women in Leadership Archives and all of the sesquicentennial scholars who worked diligently worked on this project. Tonight's program is one of the many ways the university libraries facilitates the academic pursuits and cultural enrichment of Loyola and the community. On behalf of the libraries, I want to take the opportunity to thank donors who provide financial support that enables us to sponsor events, acquire books and other resources, support digital initiatives, enhance our facilities, and support professional development. The university libraries needs this type of support to continuing offer user-focused services and programs for the Loyola community and the nearby neighborhoods. If you would like to learn more about how to support us and how to get involved, please visit our website, libraries.luc.edu. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Alumni Relations Office for their support with event promotions and program preparations. Here with us today is Alice Kovacic, Assistant Director, who will say a few words. Alice? Thank you so much, Emma. I appreciate the welcome and the introduction. Good evening to everyone joining us tonight and those who will be viewing this webinar later on. Um, thank you for being with us. We are so excited to be welcoming alumni and friends of the university from across the country. 
Uh, my name is Alice Kapachik, and I am an assistant director of alumni relations at Loyola University Chicago. It's our pleasure to be partnering with the university libraries for this next installment of our We Are Called Dialogue series. We are excited to be able to highlight the research of Loyola scholars and how we are called to make a positive difference in the world. I'll now pass it back to Emma to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Alice. It is, there's my cat. <laughs> it is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Scarlett Andes graduated with a master's degree in public history from Loyola University Chicago in May 2021 and has a deep interest in food history. She currently works at Spertus Institute in Chicago. Jennifer Duval also graduated with a master's degree in public history in May of 2021. She worked on the timeline project in the university archives and special collections as a sesquicentennial scholar during the two years that she attended Loyola. Regina Hong graduated in 2021 with a master's degree in digital humanities, where she worked as a sesquicentennial scholar at the Women in Leadership Archives. She has co-authored a book on the pre-war Japanese community of Singapore and is currently seeking employment opportunities in UX research and archival research. Jennifer will now begin the presentation. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm going to get us started by sharing a little bit about how the project started and how it developed into the exhibit that we're presenting to you today. The Loyola 150 Student Life Timeline began its journey in the fall of 2019 and evolved over the next two years through a creative and dedicated collaboration between the sesquicentennial scholars and the archivists of both the Loyola University Archives and Special Collections and the Women in Leadership Archives, which houses the records of Mundelein College. For those of you who don't, aren't aware, Mundelein was a women's liberal arts college that neighbored the Lakeshore campus from 1930 to 1990 when it affiliated with Loyola. Through this partnership, our goal was to create a project that celebrated 150 years of the university. Working out of both archives, we were able to get a picture of what was happening on the individual campuses and how the two student bodies interacted both socially and academically. When we began the planning process, we were aware that there were already several digital examples of the history of Loyola as an institution. So the first step was to come up with a new approach. The archivists had been looking for an opportunity to do an exhibit on student life and the larger sesquicentennial committee had become excited about the idea of having a digital timeline that showed the connection between the university and the wider world. So the two ideas were merged into the basic structure of the project we are presenting to you today. In creating a structural plan for the timeline, we decided that in order to show the connections between what the students were doing, what was happening in Chicago, and the events of our nation and beyond, it was best to divide the timeline into decades. We then chose themes that combine specific events of each period in time and demonstrated the connections between our chosen groups. These decisions were not made easily or lightly. Choosing the decade themes meant considering what was happening locally, nationally, and globally, and figuring out how those events and issues were reflected in student activities both on and off campus. It was important that we show not only how the happenings of the city and the world affected the students, but also how the students got involved and how their actions made a difference to others. The scholars were divided between the two archives, so the research was done in different buildings and then shared digitally. We tried to choose things that were at the same time unique to, to the school and or time period, relevant to the theme, and or showed what life was like during that specific decade. The three of us met frequently to discuss what events we wanted to include in the timeline. Our goal then as a group 
was to pare them down to the events which best represented student life in each decade. Throughout this research and decision making process, we each worked on writing some of the text in the larger exhibit and on the timeline itself, as well as creating additional smaller focused exhibits about specific topics. Although the pandemic created some bumps in the road, we managed to keep to most of our established deadlines and we finished the timeline project after a great deal of editing and revision in May of 2021. Please feel free to write any questions you have about this process I just shared with you um, or about the website itself, which Regina is now going to uh, give you a demonstration of. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, so let me begin sharing my screen. All right, so without further ado, please allow me to take you on a walkthrough of our Loyola at 150 timeline project site. So this site was built using Omica S and the timelines themselves were built using Timeline JS. And we'll take a closer look at the timelines in a bit. So when you first go to the site, you will see the homepage and at the top of the homepage, is a paragraph of text kind of giving you some contextual information about the project. And right below that, you see a series of thumbnails. Each thumbnail links to a decade page, so you can simply click on any one of them to begin your explorations. The text below each thumbnail contains the decade and the particular theme of the decade. However, if you don't wish to begin exploring the timelines first and want to learn about some themes that were happening at Loyola and Mandalay College during this time, you can look at the Exhibits tab, simply hover over the tab and you'll see a drop-down menu of our current exhibit titles. You can pick any one that picks your fancy. So since it's the 50th anniversary of the class of 1971's graduation, Let's take a look at the decade page for the 1970s, which has the team taking it to the streets. So on each decade page, there will be some text at the top with the key events that were happening in the decade and how students were reacting and interacting with those. Right below that, you'll see a bar with the title, How to Navigate. And this contains the instructions for how you can move through the timeline. So to assess these instructions, all you need to do is hover, and there'll be a drop down menu with detailed instructions on what you need to do. And right below that is the timeline itself, the one that was built using Timeline JS. In this gray section here, you see four categories, and these are institutional history, student life, world events, and Chicago events. So we decided to categorize the events as such, so you can see a visual representation of how these events are stacked on top of one another and thereby understand how students were interacting with the events in the wider Chicago area and also the world. So let me demonstrate how you can move through the timeline. You can click on the left and right arrows to move through the timeline, or you can use the left and right arrow keys on your keyboard. And you might have noticed as I was moving through the timeline that the background of the slide changes and that's because the background of the slide is color coded to reflect the category that it is part of. So for gray, this represents a world event. And for maroon, it's either an institutional event or a student life event. And for blue, that's an event that was taking place in Chicago. And you might have noticed that each slide is accompanied by an image. And that's an image of the event. And then there's a write up to the site giving you more contextual information about the event. And if you'd like to learn more about the image itself, all you need to do is click on the link at the bottom right of the image. And now I'm going to zoom us really quickly past the timeline so we can get to the last slide in this timeline to show you another feature that we have. So when you get to the end of the timeline, you will see a slide that prompts you to go to the next timeline, the next chronological timeline. So since we are in the 1970s timeline, this, is prom this will prompt you to go to the 1980s. But if you wish to jump around a bit, you don't want to explore the timelines in chronological order, that's not an issue. All you need to do is scroll back up and hover your mouse over the timelines tab and pick a timeline that you are interested in exploring. And now let me take you to the exhibits page 
So as mentioned earlier, for the exhibits, you just need to hover over the tab to pick an exhibit title that you are interested in. Or if you're more of a visuals person, you can click on the exhibits tab itself and it'll bring you to a page with thumbnails. And so you can see which picture looks particularly interesting and begin exploring from there. So let's take a look at Campus Critters. So an exhibit is essentially a page with a detailed thematic write-up of certain central themes that we saw happening amongst the student body. And then there will be many images also collected from across time reflecting this particular theme. For campus critters, we have dogs, we have cats, we have turtles, and we also have the ubiquitous squirrels and bunnies that you still see on campus today. And we definitely encourage you to explore the other exhibits as well, as we had a lot of fun putting them together. So finally, let me briefly talk about the last two tabs you see, the last two tabs you see here. So for the About tab, you will find more contextual information about the project and the sesquicentennial scholars themselves. And in the Acknowledgements and Resources tab, you'll find information about the resources that we used in the course of our research, along with links to external archival collections so that you can also begin exploring them if you wish. So that's all for the walkthrough of this website. If you have any questions at all, please leave them in the chat and we'll be happy to answer them during the Q&A session. So now over to you, Scarlett. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, as our time at Loyola was wrapping up, we wanted to document our reflections on the project uh, and on our work and research in order to share it with future students, alumni, and others. So now I would like to share with you a video that we created in the spring of 2021 um, that will uh, have us posing questions to ourselves. And then we would love to hear questions from you, which you can put in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll soon have our Q&A. As part of commemorations for the 150th anniversary of Loyola University Chicago's founding, the sesquicentennial scholars created the Loyola at 150 Student Life Timeline Project to shine a light on students' college experiences and to explore how these experiences have changed since 1870. Using the rich resources of the University Archives and Special Collections and the Women and Leadership Archives, the scholars collaborated to create an interactive website where users can explore the past and gain insights into the present. What was the research process like? I worked in the University Archives and Special Collections at Loyola and my process was looking through newspapers, digital resources, lots of pictures, and other physical items within the archives in order to understand what students found important over the many years that Loyal has been in existence, what activities they were involved in that were unique and or regular events, uh, how they interacted with the school as far as what their opinions were and, and their needs were over time, and how they were involved in the city and other events in the city and other events in the world around them and trying to piece together the interesting events with good media uh, that would interest a varied audience. For myself, I got involved with research after we had to move online thanks to the pandemic. So I was looking at what digitized collections I could find in Preservica, um, which is this platform that the school uses to aggregate items from various archives and the University and Marketing Collections Photo Gallery and Archive.org where you have a lot of old Loyola yearbooks to see what kinds of events could be found and placed onto the timeline, especially for the later decades. So when I started out at the Women in Leadership Archives, my role was to really get a sense of Mundelein College student history. Since they were right next to Loyola's Lakeshore campus, uh, there was a lot of overlap and interaction um, throughout uh, both schools' histories. So after we moved online, that expanded to also include supporting university archives research and creating the documents online uh, so that we could continue to, to maintain all of that information about them that we keep in the archives. Which event stood out the most to you and why? 
one of the the events that kind of persisted the longest, especially in the well, in the twentieth century, was pushball. Um, pushball was a a game uh, played between the freshmen and the sophomore classes. And uh, the goal was to get this enormous ball to the other team's side. And it, it was pretty crazy uh, and fun. But the, the whole motivation was that if the freshmen won, they got to, to stop having to wear beanies all over campus, which they hated. So they had a great motivation to win. And they almost always did. The sophomores very rarely prevailed. And then on a more serious note, uh, the school's involvement with World War II was pretty extensive. Um, the, I mean, of course, the sheer number of young men that entered the war uh, was, was very large. And they also taught classes to lay people about uh, interesting things about the war, like maps and things of that nature. They also provided dental and medical school degrees at a, at a shorter, more concentrated rate so that they could send doctors and nurses and dentists overseas as rapidly as possible to help soldiers along with just a ton of fundraising they bought ambulances for the war effort and and a lot of other things so it was it was very interesting to see all the bits and pieces that went into their involvement in world war ii for myself i was very fascinated by the presence of pets on campus and particularly interested in the turtle derbies which was a nationwide phenomenon that was taking place in the 1950s. So um, the turtle derby in general is a kind of race where turtles race against one another and Loyola and Mandelheim both had both held their own turtle derbies actually and they I think got the turtles from soup companies so the turtles would be squaring off against one another and the events seem to have been public. So sometimes members of the public, when they were walking by the school, they would see students crowded around a bunch of turtles just racing against one another. So I think that would have presented a very interesting sight. But it also seemed the turtles' lives were a bit dangerous because they might have been kept outdoors. And then sometimes when there was a flood, <laughs> the turtles would be swept away. And we have an article in the skyscraper where some turtles were swept away in the flood of 1954. So that was really interesting to read about. Um, on a more serious note, uh, I was also really interested to learn about the Foucault pendulum. So. The Foucault pendulum is something that's used to measure the Earth's rotation and there was one installed at um, Mandelein College in an empty elevator shaft they had in June 1938 and this was suggested by a physics professor, Sister Mary Therese Langerbeck and this pendulum was huge, it was 9 stories tall, it had a 30 pound bob and the students actually broadcast their findings on the Earth's rotation via the school's radio station they determined the gravitational constant for Chicago and that happened in October 1938. And this Foucault pendulum was used for two decades until 1958 when the Museum of Science and Industry unveiled its own Foucault pendulum. One of the events that really stood out to me um, in the skyscraper, the Mundelein College student newspaper, there was a bit of a controversy over a new dance called the twist. Uh, it appears a group of students has sort of taken over the student lounge, so to speak, for twisting uh, with loud music. And the students who were in there um, playing cards were not so pleased. So they wrote letters to the editor back and forth, either attacking or in defense uh, of their dance. Some felt it was inappropriate or that no one looked good doing it, too suggestive. Um, so someone actually suggested that maybe girls should practice before they do the twist in the lounge. It was very contentious. And then on a, again, a more serious note, but in the same vein, I really loved seeing the way that um, music and performance played a role in student life throughout the school's history um, as, as a real constant. And it re really brought the sort of past student life to life for me. Uh, you could see all these different musical ensembles, both big ones, official ones, and small ones that played in local um, eateries and performance venues. 
Um, and even students would put together their own bands for their own dances. So there was a, a lot of fun detail uh, to, to see in that. And it was um, really neat to see the way it changed over time as well. What was the most challenging part of the process for you? Well, I think we all agree that uh, the pandemic has been the most challenging um, part of this uh, for all of us. For me, it was really difficult because the UASC has a massive collection of information. So very little of it has been able to be digitized. And so uh, from home, it was hard to do a lot of the research that I needed to do. But uh, luckily, I, I did find things to do. And uh, I was allowed to start coming back to the archives on a limited basis in October. And that's been a huge help. Yeah, I echo what Jennifer said about the pandemic that was challenging. And for myself, it was really working with Omika S, the platform that we used to create the website that was especially challenging. So Omika S is pretty easy to use, but it has its own idea on how to show information. And we had our own ideas on how we wanted information to be shown. So it's a kind of negotiation with Omika S in terms of code to get it to show information in a way that we felt would be more intuitive for users to use. I guess from the research point of view one, uh, as well, one of the challenges we had throughout the whole time uh, was that it's fairly easy for an institution to record its own history, um, but perhaps less so for an institution to record the student experience. Um, because simply students, uh, there are so many, they turn over every year. Um, so in fact, there's not as much as the institutional history. Uh, and so it was a challenge trying to sort of find the pieces of that in the archives when there is so much uh, and to be able to find the story in that as well. What was the most exciting part of the process for you? For me, uh, the whole process has been uh, very enjoyable. Um, I, I really loved seeing how students have evolved yet stayed the same, how, how their interests have changed and um, just kind of the story of that history over time is really, really interesting to me. Lots of really cool uh, materials in the archives. Uh, so that, that's been fun. Uh, but the most exciting part is seeing it done. Um, it's been <laughs> a really uh, long process. And um, I think it's just great to see the whole thing completed. Yeah, definitely echo what Jennifer said. We have been working on this project for almost two years since December 2019. So it's very exciting to see it completed. For myself, I really liked the usability tests we did with um, potential users of the site. So a usability test is kind of a process where, in, where we invite people to test out our first draft of the website and give us comments on what they think about the website, what could be in, improved, so on and so forth. And I think that really drove home the point for me that, oh, this is a website that is actually going to be used by people. It's not a project that uh, we were just seeing inside our head. So it's very exciting to see how people were reacting to the project. And they actually pointed out very useful things that had completely escaped our attention. So actually in the first draft of this website, we had no site banner and we had been staring at this website for a really long time and it just never occurred to us that we had no site banner. So I really liked that process of this project. For me, the most exciting thing um, was being able to use the exhibit function in Omika in order to sort of tell stories that didn't lend themselves to the sort of linear timeline storytelling. So either things that were centered around a very particular sort of time period, like World War II, um, where there was so much that really wouldn't fit well in the timeline. And then uh, as well as themes that it was a much longer story that told itself better altogether. So for instance, performance and, and theater and, and music. So um, for me, that was a, a lot of fun to be able to try and make the best use of the media we had, which were really cool, and sort of tell that story in a deeper way as well. 
So that's all we've got for now, um, but there's so much that we couldn't fit uh, in our time today. So uh, you can check out the Loyola at 150 student life timeline at the link in the description below, uh, explore the timelines and exhibits. And if you follow both of our archives on social media, you'll hear all about our future projects. Thanks for watching. So as we mentioned in the video, we could not have done a project of this scope and scale um, without the materials in both of our archives. Um, however, uh, as we mentioned, student history has a way of slipping away without being recorded. Uh, for alumni, um, as you explore the timeline, um, we ask that you perhaps consider if you might have records or photos um, documents, videos, 3D objects that might um, perhaps represent something unique or memorable or that was significant to your time as a student at Loyola or Mundelein, um, and that you might consider donating to the archives. Um, if you'd like to or would like to talk about it um, with the archivists, um, I'll be posting the um, web pages about donation in the chat in just a minute. Um, Materials donated to the archives contribute to the larger stories of student life over time and will help future archivists, researchers, students, um, alumni, and anyone interested uh, to understand and connect with the richness and scope of student life um, throughout the years. So, um, and then hopefully as our, as our timeline can show, um, it can also help shape those experiences going into the future. So please consider uh, perhaps contributing to the archives and helping tell these stories um, beyond the 150th. And um, finally, uh, we would love to turn it over to Jocelyn to begin the Q&A. Thank you so much. This has been very fascinating and all your rich experiences that you've shared with us today. And your, uh, so thank you so much to all of you and our audience members. Please go ahead and type in your questions in the Q&A. And we do have a question already here. So uh, for Jennifer, Regina, and Scarlett, let's see. This one, uh, thank you to uh, Liz Hopwood. So this is wonderful. I'm curious, what decade was your favorite to work on and why? Um, oh, I can go first. Um, it's, it's a really tough choice. Uh, I have to say that in terms of decades where things got really um, fascinating to dive into the student newspapers, I think the 1970s were um, quite a journey. Uh, there was so much going on and students had a lot to say about it. And perhaps um, it was very hard to choose individual events to add. Um, and all the decades were like that. But in particular, I think there's so much protest and music and uh, you know, media, new movies coming out, all sorts of reviews of up and coming bands that were performing nearby. So um, yeah, it was, that personally was probably the one that stands out. Um, which one of you would like to go next? I can go. Um... For me, that's a really hard question um, <laughs> because I enjoyed so many of them. I think the 80s um, and 90s were a lot of fun for me because I was alive during them. I'm old. And <laughs> so uh, it was really fun to kind of remember what was happening at the time and how it happened and see how it affected the students. Um, so for me, that was a lot of fun because there's things I totally forgot about, but oh my gosh. Um, so <laughs> that was a, that was a lot of fun. And there was a lot going on in the eighties, especially in terms of students having a kind of a more open outlook to the world, I think coming out of the seventies into like what was happening in other countries and human, um, um, causes for, for, yes, I can't talk, um, different causes in other countries and helping in that way. Yeah, as Scarlett and Jennifer have said, it's a hard choice. But I think for me, um, being a foreigner, so I'm actually not American, I'm from Singapore. So I really found it very meaningful to research the 1960s because you hear a lot about the civil rights movement, but 
I don't think I fully appreciated the extent of it and how it was carried out in schools and how it was very important for shaping um, subsequent discourse on civil rights and things like that. So I learned a lot personally from researching that particular decade. Great, thank you so much. So our next question from Elizabeth Ann Stewart. A wonderful project. Thanks so much for sharing. Most of my publications are in the Women's Archives in Piper Hall, and it's good to see the interest in preserving experiences from the past that can help build the future. So this is um, kudos to everybody. So she it says, congratulations. A uh, question here. Fiona Rowe, um, are there any that have persisted over time or that you wish were still around today? She's a great presentation. So that was her question. Um, thanks. Um, Jennifer, do you want to go first? I think I saw this one in the chat. It's talking about the, the push ball, right? Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes the game between ball. freshmen and sophomores. Um, are there any other things that persist? I mean, I would love to see push ball come back, but really, in truth, it would got mm -hmm. kind of violent after a while, <laughs> and so um, they had to discontinue it because, yeah, there's some interesting pictures of that. Um, but you know, it was also just a they had a had a good time doing it too. So I mean, it was kind of fun, um, but other. Other traditions like that, I'm trying to think. Can you guys think of anything else that went on for that long? Because that was that was like 40 years or something. They did push ball 30 or 40 years. It's a long time. They had a carnival. Um, and the they had a they had a carnival with Ferris wheel, the whole nine yards on campus for many years, which was pretty cool. I don't know where you would put it now, but <laughs> back then they had, you know, fewer buildings. Um, yeah, that, I don't know, you guys have anything? Yeah, I can go next. So um, I think one particular tradition that I found really interesting uh, that I wish it still go on, I'm not sure if it does, it's the candle lighting ceremony. So this was a ceremony where students at Mandalayan College, they kind of lit up candles in the windows. And then the ceremony kind of evolved over time. But one of its most distinctive marks was that you'll be able to see the windows lit up from Sheridan Road. And that, to me, seemed really meaningful because it was the whole school coming together just before the holiday break. And I, I suppose we still have that tradition, well, pre-pandemic, where I saw students like skating on the ice rings and things like that. But I thought the candle lighting ceremony was one that was particularly beautiful to me, just visually. I think it's also interesting to look at traditions that started out and then maybe fizzled out. Um, for instance, one of Mundelein College's first social events was a um, celebration of President's Day where they danced and ate cherry pie in honor of George Washington. Um, so these sort of <laughs> things that really speak to the time. Um, also in the 1930s, they started holding tea dances, which were these social events with tea and, and uh, cheap refreshments uh, held with Mundelein and Loyola students. And uh, they, would, they would go all out decorating with different themes and they would put together their own bands. Um, and those actually did persist from the 30s through the 60s was the last mention we found of them. So um, certain things did hang on for quite a while and seemed like they would have been a fun time. Um, and actually in terms of ongoing traditions, there are lots of things that do continue um, such as International Night and other sort of um, festivals and, and uh, recurring events for fundraisers, for various charities. So um, there is actually quite a lot of continuity um, that did surprise us, which was nice to see. Listen, you talked about the projects you know, by, by decade. So there's a question here from the chat. Can you talk more about the decision to organize a project by decade and theme? How did you arrive there? And were there other options that came up that you decided against? can take that if you want. <laughs> um, um, we, I, I don't really remember there being a lot of separate um, ideas. The theme idea came after the decades because we knew we wanted to do a timeline. That was um, 
an absolute, there was going to be a timeline. Um, and so as we started thinking about the amounts of information that we would have and trying to compare what was going on on campus to the city to the world that becomes a large amount of things to try to connect so that's when the idea for a theme having a theme to kind of rein us in because when you sat us down in a room with all the different things we found because we researched separately so then we would come together and we would have like ladies i don't know 40 things we wanted to put in each decade and <laughs> <laughs> easily like us, 90 yeah all of us had really good reasons for why they needed to be there most of them in the end didn't but we liked them um so we were very excited and um and so then we had to pare that down um significantly <laughs> um so the themes really helped because we could go well these things don't really fit with what we're trying to do and and some things some things we just left in but don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> mostly the themes really helped us out in that area where we could go, this doesn't fit, this fits, this doesn't fit. Um, and so that was very, very helpful for us. Thank you. So from the Q&A, Kyle Roberts, congratulations on seeing the culmination of this project. Could you talk a little bit about how this fit into the university's larger sesquicentennial celebrations? Has this been a chance to to work with other units in the university beyond the archives? Um, sure. So uh, toward the end, um, we did work a, a lot through the um, university marketing, um, who were immensely helpful in helping us find recent photos, uh, as well as the Loyola Phoenix. Um, we had help uh, from their archive as well. Um, we one thing we came up against in terms of these kind of collaborations that we hope to do was the pandemic. Um, we uh, did much of this work uh, virtually and a lot of the celebrations that had been planned and in person talks we, we had um, been planning on giving ended up being canceled or postponed so uh, I think we're just starting to see those collaborations and hopefully those will keep going forward as well. Wonderful. Um, how about the, um, let's see, this question about the, from the chat, because they do talk about the culture of the university. Uh, how do you think the culture of the university is able to transfer then from generation to generation? Considering the continuous physical change of the university, the staff and the student body, uh, this um, audience members had great job on this project and excited to explore the website. Thanks. Um, sure. Would either of you like to go for it, Regina? Yeah, I can take that question. Um, I think for me personally, it's hard to transfer the entirety of the culture for, across time because so much has changed. Your external circumstances change as well. So the kinds of students you have, the kind of faculty you have, the kind of teaching you have is different. But um, Personally, for myself, I got to experience a lot of Mandalay College's culture just by reading the archives and then through the oral history project, the Share Your Story project that the Women Leadership Archives runs. Simply by talking to the alumni, I got to know about the kinds of pedagogical approaches that the um, teachers at Mandalay College took, the kinds of lessons they had. And I think that that's one of the strongest ways in which culture is passed down through time because you have like alumni talking to you and sharing with you their insights. So even though that particular culture might not be existing now, you can still access what it was like for those students when they talk about it, when you read about how they write about it. Um, I agree. One thing that I would say that I think was very clear um, having looked through 150 years of newspapers, um, <laughs> uh, is the one thing I think that maintained, and you guys can correct me if you disagree, feel free, uh, but I think that maintained throughout was the idea of social justice from the like Jesuit university perspective. Um, students were very active in every decade. Um, if you look through the timeline, you see things from you know student groups, 
composing letters to the state legislature to, you know, in the 70s and 60s, obviously protests and into the 80s when they were fundraising and doing, you know, protests for um, ending apartheid and, and other things around the world. Also, like Habitat for Humanities was a huge part of the university for a long time. So, you know, that part of the Jesuit tradition, I think, has stuck with the university um, throughout, even, you know, in the summer of 2020, when everything was going crazy, they still were having, you know, nonviolent protests on campus and, you know, all of those things still exist. So I think if there's one cultural thing that I, I can say fairly, fairly certainly, that's kind of maintained for 150 years, it would be that. I agree as well. And I, I think that having had the experience of we, we really began our research at the earliest decades and then walked through. Um, and so having the, I guess, the really the, the, the privilege of the opportunity to do that and see that really slow change over time was, I mean, absolutely fascinating. And we hope that that comes across in the timeline uh, where you can see the differences in, in both how the school treated students, how students approached their school, um, and how they spoke about themselves as students. Um, in a lot of ways, it, that you have the same themes of, you know, finding common interest and um, finding issues you're concerned about and, and getting together to speak out about them. Um, but the ways they do it and the voice changes, it's slow. But, you know, um, picking an article from the 1950s versus the 1970s, uh, the voice would be totally different. And I think that was one of the really neat things to see um, was just how that changed over time, as well as the parts that stayed the same. Right, and I think this question is related uh, because of the diversity. And did, did you find a lot of images of the minority student population in your timeline? Or are there any images right now? I go for it, Regina. Yeah. Okay. Um. Sorry. So for the two that come to the top of my head are Mercuba. So that's the Mandalay College United Black Association. So they were active in the nineteen sixties and for some time after that, and also, um, Operation Breadbasket. So we have um a a really good picture of Reverend Jesse Jackson, and then for a separate blog piece that I did for the Women and Leadership Archives, we go into a lot more detail about that. But on the timeline, we definitely have those representations included. Yeah, over to you, Scarlett. Oh, sure. No, we were very conscious because um, as we were doing this project, um, there was a lot of talk in the archival community, in particular, um, addressing inequalities in terms of what is recorded. And so we had sort of a special eye out to make sure that we were paying attention and finding um, mentions of things that were not necessarily the majority experience. Um, so lots of minority student groups um, that we wanted to highlight, all sorts of um, uh, various students of different backgrounds sharing opinions on things. So I can't think of any in, in specific uh, examples in addition to the ones Regina mentioned, but um, yes, you will, you will find them um, throughout. The timeline. Um, one from from Loyola, and this was also another part of the evolution of the school that is is interesting. You'll see a significant change in the 50s, 60s, 70s um, about the population diversity, cultural diversity, um, and and I think we we tried as much as we could. Again, like Scarlett said earlier, you know it's hard to find student life information, and the closer you get to the present, it's even harder. Um, so yes, I think we did. We tried to document, you know, that change and, and those important events as much as we could. We have a question from the chat. Um, we're in, thank, this person said, thanks for this primer. Did you find any time periods where there were little or no content available? I'll take that one um, because it almost killed me. Um, <laughs> the 1880s were dry. <laughs> the 1870s weren't good. 1890s were a little better. The 1880s were horrible. So the early 1800s, obviously, because everything was crumbling, there weren't a lot of pictures being taken. Um, so, you know, we have mostly documents like um, there, there was a huge 
Loyal or St. Ignatius, as it was was at the beginning. St. Ignatius was big on de like debate and oratorical competitions. So we had tons of programs and, and things of that nature. That was a big thing. Um, they also still had music back then. So I think there's a little bit of that in there. Uh, but yeah, the 18, the, the beginning, the first three decades were rough. <laughs> Well, perhaps this um, you know, audience you know, be, be learning so much uh, across the decades that you've researched. So maybe someone out there would be doing their own research and maybe contribute some of that information. But earlier you mentioned that um, you are interested in acquiring other materials or other information. So from the Q and A, uh, it said, uh, "Are you interested in anything related to Loyola Law School?" Certainly, we you'll find a couple stories um, about Loyola Law School history, um, including uh, an instance some people in the audience might remember where uh, the students threatened to sue Loyola um, over a, a subpar law library. So yes, um, the, the sh long story short, uh, that is that would be very welcome and definitely encourage you to, to contact the archivists. I can share one more thing about the law library. Um, in addition to the School of Sociology, which at Loyola was the first school to attract a large number of female students, um, the law school uh, be announced they would uh, um, they would accept female students in 1921, uh, and they had to build a separate women's restroom in order to accommodate the new students. Um, and they attracted female students right away. Uh, and so that was sort of the beginning of the sort of wheels turning of a, a um, turning from a mostly men's school into a uh, much more balanced school. Wonderful. Well, that's definitely good information. So we, there's lots more I know we could share. So please feel free, everyone in the, in the audience. We can still answer questions, place them in the Q&A or chat function. And for those who didn't catch it, but it's on the chat, we did place the website for the timeline. Well, I, I would like to ask, like, what do you see maybe for, for the future generation as they perhaps work on the next you know, decades or so, some future opportunities for this uh, type of project? Sure. Um, Jennifer, sorry. Oh, do you mean like for people to do something similar or for the uses for this project as it is? No, any of those. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> either one. Either one, uh, yeah. Well, hopefully the project will be a good starting off point for anybody that's trying to do research um, that has to do with a time period with college students, with um, universities, with you know, anything. You could find ideas through our timeline and hopefully be able to find uh, further research in the in the archives and beyond. Um, it also is, I think, you know, useful for for alumni because they get to kind of see things that like I did in the '80s that they may have forgotten about, and um, so that may be enjoyable to them and for you know current students to know more about their school. Scarlet, you. Oh no, you got what I was gonna say with the last point. Um, I know for myself, especially as we were finishing up the website and really um, putting on the finishing touches, um, my the, the thing that kept coming back to me was um, hoping that, um, that 
current and future students would find the website and might enjoy, you know, seeing um, their school in all of the forms it's had and, and really um, perhaps finding commonalities with past students and sort of seeing themselves uh, as, as they start their Loyola journey and sort of seeing what has been possible in the past and maybe what they, you know, want to bring back or, or change or it's such a of a bank of possibilities. Um, maybe it's time for turtle derbies to come back. I don't know. Um, or, you know, there were certain talks or or various student hosted things that, you know, who knows, uh, time to revive a tradition or time to, you know, spark something new. So um, absolutely just hope that people find things in it because there is so much. Um, but yeah, that, that would be the hope for the future. Yeah, and just to chime in on that, I think it would be really fun if um, classes of the subsequent decades, if they need, I don't know, a conversation starter for their class reunions, you look back on what was happening during that year or the years that you were at college, and then maybe you could do an oral history on that because what we have on the timeline is just what we could gather from the resources that we have, but maybe other people who were involved might have different perspectives. And then in a way that helps to add more to the archives. So it's this really cool cycle where you use the archives to drive your conversation, to create more contributions to the archives. So I think that will be a really fun use of our timeline if people were interested in that. Thank you. We do have a couple more questions. Uh, one from the Q&A. Uh, when searching the website, can you look at specific schools within Loyola, such as the School of Nursing? There are things from the specific schools on the timeline. There is no way to zero in on just those things. Um, but we tried to cover you know, what we could from all of the schools um and Loyola um so yes there are things I think from everywhere <laughs> I can safely say uh but there's no way to just find um the nursing school for instance hey um there is a slightly indirect way like what you put is there's no direct way but if you use the search function and you put school of nursing in quote marks it should pull up related images or if you are just interested in nursing in general you can type in nursing in the search bar and i sorry i should have talked about this during my website demonstration but in the top right corner there's a little search with bar with a, that magnifying glass so you can definitely type in natural language keywords like nursing school of nursing loyola law school and it should pull up relevant results That's good, that's helpful. And one more question, uh, we can, I'm sure we can answer more. So the, this one from the Q&A, in the 1960s, there were very few women. When Mandelein merged with Loyola, there was a large infusion of women students and faculty members. Did you see any effects of this? Uh, definitely. Um, uh, actually, Regina, do you wanna weigh in on this first? because uh, we were the two who were at the Women in Leadership Archives. We were very uh, much surrounded by Mundelein College history. Yeah, um, I'm kind of taking a refresher on my own memory because it's been a minute since we looked at this, but um, I was looking at our spots and Mundelein exhibit. And I think when more women started um, coming to Mundelein College and, uh, and taking classes at Loyola, that's when you started seeing co-ed events. And I believe there was a team of Mandeline and Loyola cheerleaders as well. And um, I believe that that is one of the direct effects because you couldn't have a single gender spot anymore. You had to have the genders coming together to kind of interact with one another and kind of like bond. So that was one effect I saw. So how about you, Scarlett? Um Absolutely. I think uh, browsing through the 90s in particular, you'll see um, there were several efforts to help uh, Mundelein students feel more at home. Uh, the ones who were not able to finish their degrees at Mundelein uh, and who became Loyola students, 
Um, and so that you'll find some examples of that. Um, and then you'll also see certain departments from Loyola, uh, from Mundelein um, merged with Loyola. And so something like the Peace Department, Peace Studies, um, which became the Peace Studies minor at Loyola. And so you'll, you'll see some examples of that, of the sort of how that merge played out. Um, and there's there were definitely more that we wanted to share. Um, and so you'll see what, what made it into the timeline. Thank you so much. We have reached the end of our program. It is now seven o'clock. On behalf of the university libraries and the alumni relations office, thank you so much to our speakers, Jennifer, Regina, and Scarlett, our project partners, and to all of you who attended today's Loyola at 150 program.